In most communities, high school basketball is just a game. It's something to do on a Friday night. But in 1985, the city was in the midst of transition and basketball became part of the fabric of this community. The Mansfield Senior High School boys basketball team would embark on a magical season that would forever link the city to its beloved Tigers. Webster's Dictionary defines a tiger as a large carnivorous striped feline. But in Mansfield, Ohio, the tiger has an additional meaning. You see, our tiger not only means pride and community, it represents a connection, a bond between a team and its fans. We are the Mansfield TY Tigers, and the Y makes us one. Mansfield, Ohio. The city was established in 1808. It was called the heart of the heart of America, North Central Ohio. The town was named after a surveyor general by the name of Colonel Jared Mansfield. The Colonel thought so much of the city named in his honor that he never made time to step foot in the city itself. The development of the railroad systems in the late 1800s revolutionized Mansfield's growing industry as manufacturers had local access to shipping and receiving goods via the rails. The industrial boom of the 1940s provided plentiful job opportunities and made Mansfield an attractive place to settle and raise a family. The population swelled from 17,000 to just over 43,000 between 1900 and 1940. My mother worked at the Westinghouse. Uh, maybe before that, she worked at Empire, which is now Empire Steel Mill. My dad worked at Empire Steel Mill. Uh, my dad worked for, in the street, worked for some of the people in the streets, but he construction and various other jobs. At that time, uh, a number of families were moving north from, from the south for all kinds of reasons, but mostly because of industry as opposed to just being farm labor and that kind of stuff. And there was quite a bit of industry in Ohio, but then relatives would move to, one stop would be Chicago, another stop would be Cleveland. A lot depends on how the railroads were running at that time as well. A number of people located close to major cities where the railroads were. We went to Cleveland at least initially, but my mother had a sister here and uh, some other relatives here. So she eventually relocated to, with our family to, uh, to, to Mansfield, from, from Cleveland actually. The first recognized school in the city was the Mansfield Blockhouse School, and amongst many other functions, the building provided a space where for the first time, students were able to be taught in classrooms together rather than being homeschooled. As the population of Mansfield continued to grow, the need for a true high school became more prevalent, and in 1892, John Simpson High School was built. An architectural masterpiece at the time, the building had 11 classrooms for students and would cost just over $151,000 to build. At the turn of the century, the community had experienced continued job growth and population due to the plentiful job opportunities. And as a result, the John Simpson building would be transitioned to a junior high. In 1927, the citizens of Mansfield and the school board agreed to build a new high school. Mansfield Senior High was built at a cost of $1.1 million and could house up to 1,200 students. 
The T.I. Tigers of Mansfield in the early 1900s were dominating force in athletics. And even the marching band in 1926 won the all-state title as the best in all of Ohio. The city of Mansfield had established itself as a basketball town from the start. When the High School Basketball Association in Ohio went to a tournament-style format to crown a state champion in 1908, it was the Mansfield High School team that won the inaugural state tournament and finished the season 8-1 under head coach E.L. Marting and their leading scorer, Ed Palmer. At the inception of Mansfield High School, the sports teams were known as T.I. Tigers. Local print media and school publications often refer to the school as Tigers or by their school's colors of red and white. Now there are many theories amongst Mansfielders as to why the school decided to change to the archaic spelling of Tiger with a Y instead of the traditional I. The most compelling is the idea that Mansfield's most hated football rival of the early 1900s, the masculine T.I. Tigers, came to a gentleman's agreement that the loser of a specific game would forever have to forego the proper spelling of Tiger. So the Mansfield T.I. Tigers had to honor the gentleman's agreement and thus became the T.Y. Tigers. And no one can definitively put their finger on, 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 on it. But historically, we played the Maslin T.I. Tigers. Hence, did, did somebody back in the day say, OK, fine, playing Maslin, let's come up with a why. I heard it was from a competition against Maslin. And I guess apparently we lost and had to change our name. You know, they wanted something a little more unique, I guess. And um, that's when that happened. Oh, man. You know, people always say, there's no tiger like T.Y. T.Y. meant dominant. When somebody say T.Y. Tigers and here we come, you know you're about to lose. <laughs> the athletes or the football team, no, 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 no. It's because that we all believe in the, in the vision of our school. And we believe in, we are all T.Y. Tigers, north end to the south end. So it didn't make any difference which side it was from, okay? So, the most common theory is the yearbook changed the name. But after some extensive research, a more feasible, if not practical, explanation was exposed. An interesting fact about this period in history is that oftentimes, even in sports, the Tiger spelling was manipulated by other sports teams. Most notably was Major League Baseball's Detroit Tigers. As this article in 1921 shows the spelling T.Y. Tigers, while many would proclaim the Y was an ode to the team's star, Ty Cobb, the fact remains that during the early 20th century, the team was written about as Tigers with an Y, although the jerseys bore the correct spelling. Meanwhile, back in Mansfield, Ohio, there was a nationally known club for young men in the community called the High Y Club. The club was associated with the local YMCA in Mansfield. The club consisted of young boys whose mission, as stated here, was to be positive role models in the school and be an example of dignity, pride, and respect in the halls of Mansfield Senior High. The High Y Club was initiated at Mansfield Senior High in 1928, and unexplicably by 1930, the yearbook, the school newspaper, and even local media all were referring to the Mansfield teams as Tigers with a Y. In this 1929 picture from the school's yearbook, The Manhecan, a group of students are presumably watching a football game. And while the article refers to the team as T.I. Tigers, the banner above the student section reads T.Y. Tigers. The young men named Andrew Potts and Ben Lands were holding the T.Y. Tiger banner, and they were also members of the High Y Club. Could the High Y Club have had enough influence to change the spelling of the school mascot? Maybe. But since then, the community has embraced what was once considered a grammatical error and pridefully labeled the sports teams with one of the most unique mascot names in the state of Ohio. One that would not only separate them from their hated rivals from Stark County, 
but would spark a period of athletic dominance for the following four decades. By the 1980s, the landscape of Mansfield had changed. The once thriving industrial city was losing all of its manufacturers. WCI Laundry Division in Mansfield is being detailed these days, and it's not good. The old Westinghouse plant is losing two more product lines, this time to a sister plant in Connersville, Indiana. The WCI Laundry Division will go from 800 workers to around 150 employees by fall. That's the word as the United Auto Workers Union in Connersville voted by less than 70 votes to accept a four-year wage freeze and other concessions. The future of the Mansfield plant is not good. While unemployment was on the rise, so was crime and drug use. The use of crack cocaine and other narcotics had become a nationwide epidemic by this time. A lot of things were not going well in Mansfield. You know, we had the General Motors moving in, a lot of industry moving in, a lot of uh, unemployment, so it gave people something to get excited about. Industry was starting to wane a little bit. Um, it was starting to become a little bit of a rougher place, I think, and uh, tougher for families to make it uh, financially. I came to Mansfield in 1965 when my father was transferred here. He worked for U.S. Steel. And it was, at that time, a massively industrial community. Empire Detroit, GM, Westinghouse, Tappan. They all had major manufacturing facilities in the area in 1965. What I recall more about the period we're talking about, 84, 85, is when that kind of started to change and, and companies started to move out of the area and ultimately I mean as we sit here today I think they're all gone. Although the city and community was being challenged socioeconomically, one thing was always constant, their love for high school basketball and by this time there were many area schools with quality basketball teams. But the two most prominent were the two city school teams, the Mansfield Senior T.Y. Tigers and the Malabar Falcons. Two schools separated by 3.8 miles, and the rivalry between the schools was fierce. So, yeah, it was big. Uh, you get prepared for that on the Monday. We play on Friday. So you started, the school started the spirit day on that Monday of the week. So we were red and white all week with different days and different things that we would have to wear or whatever. And when we would see this, man, we was just, this is spirit. This is pride, man. Like, you, we, we got into it. Because if you didn't get a ticket that day or the earlier that week, uh, you were out uh, because they would sell out. 
every time. Like, no half nothing. It was always a sellout at Marysville Senior or at Mellow Bar when we played together. So if you didn't have a cousin or a relative at the high school to get that ticket for you, it was a chance that if you didn't get to the door early enough, you were not getting in. <laughs> you know, our whole community, everybody was out at those games. People uh, would go to the store and get and buy new clothes. You know what I mean? I'm gonna come to the game sharp. You know what I mean? And and it was uh, it was it was uh, exciting. It was you you never knew because Malabar was outstanding, but Senior High could beat them. You know what I mean? Senior High had beat them the year before. Everybody in the community rallied around those games. Friday nights, there was no seat you could get in the Pete Henry gym. I mean, we were all excited about going to the games. We were all excited about getting behind the Tigers, buying Tiger gear and trying to get to the games. Finally, there are those who don't need any kind of costume. When this game started, Malabar Senior High started, you, you, you were on the edge of your seat from the beginning to the end of the game. Some of the games, you know, some parts of the games you, you, you never forget. You know, some parts of the game you, you, you can't believe, you know, but it was, it was awesome, man. It was awesome. And uh, I think the most pivotal game that set this thing off was that Tommy Murphy senior year. In one year, they were, um, I think, third or fourth in the state and they were an outstanding team. And uh, I think when we played, they beat us in the season, um, 15, 16 points, and we came up against them in, in, the, uh, in the tournament at Ash, and we beat them. Um, and I think that was the signal. This is all on. Right. And I think that was the start of this, and then we moved into the uh, to the Barcats and to the Martinets and the Melvins and those guys and and and, and it just got more intense each game each time. Well, the tough part was it didn't matter if one team was good and the other one wasn't. It was always going to be a great game just because of the cross town, the kids knowing each other, uh, the coaches knowing each other. Uh, they knew what we were going to do, we knew what they were going to do, and, uh, and it meant a lot to the city because it was bragging rights, and the guys wanted to say, you know, we're city champs. The other schools, you know, Madison and, and the other schools in the area uh, were not the rivalry that, that Malabar was. So it was a cross-town rivalry. Um, the players got into each other, and even sometimes the coaches got into each other. For me, going up against Martinet, it was, it was like I was the underdog and he was the great white hope. <laughs> and it was one, one, of them, one of them games was going to be my time to shine, and I had one, so I was happy. But those, I mean, you know, like Coach said, we grew up with them dudes, you know what I'm saying? Faco and Melvin and all them, you know, playing at the park together. You, kind of get a sense of, you know, how that game don't go. That Malabar game come Friday night, boy, you, you can feel it all through the school. And then when you hit either gym, it was like a mist on the floor. It was it was nothing like it, man. It was like, it was like being in the cha NBA championship, you know, Sweet 16, like that, man. It was, it was just, it was great. It was great, it was great. Well, 84, 85, I remember, for, kind of ironically, the, the uh, Malabar ended up beating Senior High twice that year. Um, and Malabar um, was loaded, basically loaded. They were, they, the year before, they had, they had gone 19 and one and Senior High was the only team to beat them in their regular season. So the ships of Malabar went 19 and one, 20 and 0 back to back seasons. And of course the Tigers were, were, were loaded too. I mean, they had, uh, uh, just about everything you want, you know, Bubba Toddy, Ahmed Kent, uh, you know, Tyrone Buck, Tim Harless, uh, you know, it's just, just a really good, it's been a, it's been a connection, it's been a special, you know, everybody, you know, they're Tigers and it's just, and Falcons and it's, uh, there's something about it that, that, that's just, uh, uh, that people just kind of have a passion for it, I guess, maybe it's a good word to use. That if you didn't have your ticket by Tuesday or Wednesday, 
then you weren't getting in or you were plotting a way to sneak in somehow, one of the two. So, but you were going to that game somehow. I didn't like Malibu, man. <laughs> you want me to be honest? P. Henry Gym was so packed that they had to open the back windows up there on the top back shell. They had to open the windows up. There's that much smoke coming out. That's that many people. And I didn't realize it because, you know, I, people should tell me coming up, you know, you know, man, you know, y'all got to be Malibu. You got to be Malibu. I'm like, man, what's up with the deal with Malibu? The first time I ever busted through the paper in, in P. Henry Gym, and I saw all them people. I mean, on the floor, I mean, I mean, at the doors, I mean, you know, you can hear, who that talking about beating them Tigers? I mean, you hearing all this. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. I mean, and the intensity of it. I had never seen coaches, Coach Pratt, Coach now, I had never seen that much, that tense. Looking over there, looking at the, you know, looking over there like the coach, you know, I had never seen it. And all Coach Pratt was to say to us, he says, he said, if y'all don't win no other, <laughs> Y'all gonna win no other game. We we win in this game here. Um, it was fierce. It was intense. Not just between the players. I, I really think the players themselves. You know, it was a good game, and they were up for it. But I feel like the fans and the schools. They it was it was a, a lot bigger for the people that weren't actually playing. The city itself, everybody was uh, buzzing when the Mansfield Senior Malabar um, game came in. Um, but the rivalry had a lasting impact on young kids, on older people. But it was clean. You know, I, I don't remember, I'm sure there might have been, but I don't remember there being like fights after the games or... It was a hard-fought game that both schools desperately wanted to win every single time they played, and and it it was those those memories that we had of those games were just unforgettable, and and those are those games were the reasons why myself included, a lot of young people wanted to play basketball. All I wanted in my life was to put on a red and white jersey and play for senior high Malabar as a young as a young player, and that's the type of impact that. Um, those games had the Malabar rivalry was really something that um, was unique to Mansfield and I know there's rivalries all over but it was unique to Mansfield because the community was so tight-knit until that game you know and then that game came and it was almost like a civil war amongst houses. The Mansfield Tiger basketball team was very talented and each of their starting five was a perfect fit for their individual roles. First there was Robbie Andrews a six-foot bruiser who was a football player and enforcer on defense. Uh, very good physical, good rebounder. Uh, perfect guy for that team with, with Toddy and Kent and, and those guys, and the, kind of the guy that uh, you know did some of the dirty work for him, but another good, solid player. Then there was Tyrone Buck, center and heart and soul of the Tiger attack. At six foot five, he was a threat to score inside and out and could hit a 15-foot jumper while dominating on the block. Uh, Tyrone Buck was uh, really solid, uh, and that's the one word that comes to mind when I think about him. Solid. He was a guy that could pretty much do it all. He, you know, he was an inside guy. I saw him catch the ball on the block. You know, he was so businesslike. He was like he'd go about his business. He got rebounds. He made post moves. And you know, as a young person, that's not uh, the flash. You want the guys that are out there handling the ball. Now, as a coach, you know, in my later years, I start to appreciate. <laughs> guys like Tyrone Buck but he was very solid um, solid defensively again he's the guy I remember getting feels like all the rebounds he was the uh, person that started every fast fast break because he would get the rebound kick out and then he would run the floor very hard he was the first guy that I remember seeing that I ever saw dunk a basketball in a high school game so again he, on a, he was on another level as far as I'm concerned he was a consistent offensive player. You knew what you were going to get out of him offensively. Uh, he was a good rebounder, and he was a very good defender. Um, I remember a play in particular during that state championship game where he got a goaltending call, and the ball was, I mean, I don't know how he got to it. It was just so stinking high. Um, but he was that consistent guy. He reminded me, people used to complain about Brad Doherty and how he was kind of boring. But you looked up at the score sheet and it gave you 20 and 10 every night. That was Tyrone. He wasn't flashy. Um, he could jump, but he wasn't flashy. 
but he was just consistent. He was solid, uh, and he was their best, by far their best defender. Tim Harless, a small forward at 6'3", had a really good open floor game and caused havoc on the offensive and defensive boards. But he was also a dead-eye shooter from the outside. Although a late bloomer to basketball, he was a perfect fit for the Tiger attack. That I played in organized basketball, uh, it didn't have any expectations. I knew of these guys before I ever, you know, played, you know, my junior and senior year. I knew of these guys. Um, it wasn't until uh, I actually got into practice and competed against them that I thought, yeah, you can do this. Because going in, I didn't, I didn't know, you know. I just, you know, shot around my, you know, at my house, at a hoop in, on my garage, and uh, went to the parks and played a little bit. Um, Took a couple of passes off the face from Bubba because you don't realize, you know, I'm not, yeah, took some lasers. I didn't have any organized basketball, so I, you know, some backdoor cuts and he smacked a couple off my face. I was doing pretty quickly. So I had a lot of things I was doing, like I could, you know, penetrate, get that, that, that eight to nine to ten foot jumper. I could do that. But I wasn't radar, you know, like this dude was shooting, you know, 35 feet, you know, in practices, you know, like he got that work in, you know, all the time. And and then his work ethic, they don't understand that he worked. Like he came in early and jumped rope with the heavy ropes and all this kind of stuff. And this is what makes you as a player, you have to be dedicated and you have to discipline yourself and make yourself do the things that you need to do and do them right. Ahmed Kent, Tiger shooting guard and Tiger's all-time second leading scorer with over a thousand points with no three-point line, Ahmed's flash and confidence on the court was unmatched, even though he had to adjust to the Pratt system. Um, I kind of could do what I wanted to do at St. Peter's, mm -hmm. but at Senior High it was about structure, and that's something I didn't have. Okay. I, you know. I didn't have it at all. I was strictly John's part all day on the court. Uh, Coach Pratt hated my game. Like he, he knew I he didn't, I didn't play no defense. He's telling me about that. You don't play no defense. You can score, yeah, that, that's a great thing, but you don't play no defense. Um, and you know, eventually, you know, I grew, you know, and uh, and learned the system. But it took some time. You know, outside of my dad, which, you know, obviously got me started with playing basketball, outside of him, I would be the next biggest influence for me. Um, but really, uh, not only basketball, I was, he's the kind of personality, when you grow up close to him, I wanted to be him. <laughs> so it was um, not only on the, on the basketball court, but off the court. Anybody that's been around him kind of knows that he's very, very, uh, charismatic and, and uh, his personality just kind of grows on you. So yeah, he was a major, major influence for me uh, on the court, off the court, um, the way he spoke, the way he carried himself, the way he talked, the way he played ball, the way he dressed, everything. I, I, I wanted to be it. So I could remember um, the 85-86 game, uh, I'm Kent uh, with the famous 360 over Smoke Jones. Uh, that I'll, I'll, always remember that play it, it that's a huge 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 memory for me uh, i'm a kent man he was uh, i felt like he was a you know a already a, a pro he was ready for the stage you know what i mean he was the guy that was the trendy guy he was the one that had the you know in wristbands back in those days you watch guys with wristbands and they wore it on their wrist well i'm kent was probably one of the first guys i remember wearing wristbands like higher on his arm and you know it was more about it was a lot about fashion for him and uh you know so he had his own distinct uh flair and I, I just remember him making some unbelievable moves during games and you know he was really quick and and um you know i loved his game offensively and and he was a guy that you know i don't know i don't i'm, I'm sure he didn't make every shot but it felt like he did Point guard Eric Bubba Toddy, one of, if not the greatest Tiger athlete to play in Mansfield, a two-sport All-Ohioan. Toddy was captain and the unquestioned team leader for the Tigers. Now, even though I didn't play against him in high school on the basketball court, I was a long jumper in high school. So anyone who has seen Bubba long jump, 
I would argue he was a better track athlete than he was a basketball player. He was just a freakish guy that could just jump out of the gym. And if he wanted to, he could have been, if he wanted to play football, he could have been a great wide receiver, okay? That's how talented of an athlete that Bubba Toddy was, okay? Uh, I think that when you talk about somebody, if you were to make a, a, a list of, let's name in the last 40 years, the top 20 athletes, okay, in Mansfield, Ohio, okay? Boys, top 20 athlete, girls, okay? Bubba, Bubba Tide not only gonna be in your top 20, he gonna be in your top 10, okay? Because he was that good of an athlete, okay? He was that good of an athlete. I'm pretty sure if you go to any city, it's a certain person, man, that was um was just that person. You know, that's what you know, you you're just that dude. Tidy Well was that dude. You know, I call him Tidy Well, you know, I just I just want knowing. You know, Bub Bub was that dude, you know, um even through the hallways, the varsity jacket, the whole nine, you know, the persona, everything. You know, if you hang with Bub, man, you know, you got everything, the prestige, the girls, you know, it's everything. <laughs> he was unbelievable, man. He was unbelievable. And I, everything that I did from that point on when it came to basketball, um, I tried to mimic who he was. He may as well have been black Superman. Head coach Joe Pratt, a graduate of Eastern Kentucky University, was a former All Ohio guard for the Mansfield Senior Tigers. His local roots and personal connections with his players defined his unique coaching style. Coach Pratt, how would you describe him as a as a coach? <laughs> he was very media savvy for a guy who's a high school basketball coach. Now, obviously, a, a, a tremendous basketball mind. He was an outstanding coach, outstanding individual, human being, related very well with his students and athletes. I, I can't hold Joe in any higher esteem than he, than he is. I lost my father at an early age, so coaches became my father. And everything they told me to do, I would do, because I had no father at home to direct me. Uh, my mother loved sports, so she wanted me to be involved. But when I saw what coaches had done for me in my life, I felt that, you know, I only had to pay this debt back to the kids because uh, I saw what a coach did for me. So I was hoping I could do the same for the guys I coached. Oh, I enjoyed the time with Coach Pratt's. Um, you know, you look at uh, one of the big things that I look at is our scouting reports and our breakdowns. At high school, I, for a high school level, I think we had some great scouting reports, um, breaking down um, the tendencies, let alone the X's and O's of the other team, but the tendencies of the players to go with that at a high school level, which was very good. And... Um, also, to our X's and O's, um, you know, we we were always prepared. Um, you know, of course, fitness was never a problem for us. You know. He did a very great job, and the coaches that was on his staff. So he he just did. Um, I felt um, for building pride in T Y Tigers, the red and white. Okay, uh, I thought he did an outstanding job in terms of that. Well, I think his legacy is one that is, you know, distinguished, man. He, he was a, um, a coach that really, he was probably one of the most personable people 
uh, when it comes to athletics and coaching. He was really about family. He, you know, a lot of teams say that, but imagine, you know, being in a city school, um, you know, the majority of your players year in and year out are going to be black kids um, from, from different, you know, uh, backgrounds and, and different home lives and having to manage all of that and try to get them to come together as a team um, and play for a common goal beside themselves. And I think he was a master at that. And I remember as a young man seeing him playing at Johns Park and seeing him, you know, walk in the, you know, hearing stories. I wasn't there, but hearing stories of him walking in the parties where his somebody had told him his players were where they didn't belong. Um, and to me, that is something that uh, really changed the, the tide when it comes to the success of his basketball program. He was invested in the kids and um, that is what made him stand out on top of being a really good basketball mind. I mean, this is a guy who was an all-state basketball player for senior high. One that, um, you know, the guys in the 80s primarily, you know, to a man, they all respected him. And I, I think that he deserved that respect because of not only what he done for them as players and their development, but what he was to them on and off the floor and how he cared about them as individuals. And, and you know, I think all of them, including myself as a former player of his, can appreciate what type of coach he was. Assistant Coach Wilbur Lanier, a hard-nosed, no-nonsense assistant coach that was a perfect counter to Coach Pratt's. Pratt's provided the structure, Lanier provided the muscle. Well, Coach Lanier was a different kind of guy. He was uh, very excitable and he was a good disciplinarian and he was a good man to, to back me up because he, un again, he understood the kids. And a lot of people thought he was half crazy and that kind of kept a lot of guys in line too because you never knew what Coach Lanier was going to do. But it was a nice uh, ebony and ivory mix that, that we had, and it worked for us. What are your thoughts about what Coach Lanier's impact on not only this team, but, but kind of yourself as a player? Difficult. I think he was probably the backbone of our defensive style. For an old dude waving a black bat, you'd move. <laughs> if, he, if he beat you to the spot, it was over. Yeah. And uh, he pulled me aside and said, you can play this game. And I think at that point, I realized that I'm, I'm good now. Now, that didn't change him. As Tyrone said, beating down on us, screaming at us, hollering at us, snatching us up. But him saying that, and he would do it to all of us. Yeah, we knew he could be nasty. He pull you aside, tell you, God, we can do this, man. You got this. You can play this game. And that's that's what that's what meant most to me from him. Like despite our situations that we had at home, you know, he still didn't let it, let you know let make us think that you know did you know to give up or to use that as a scapegoat to not be successful. Oh, <laughs> he Lord. left. Coach Ross left practice, right? <laughs> You had to go to a coach's meeting. Right. And we was messing around. He said, put the ball down. <laughs> and we get on the line. Ooh, I swear Lord. we ran for about three hours. <laughs> there was Am I Y'all know I ain't lying. Man. He, he, said, he, said, he, he, said, said, he said, put the ball down and get on the line. And get on the line. Coach Wilbur Lanier passed away in 2010. And the pain from his death still moves many of his players to this day. No, Coach Nair is personal to me. You know, when Coach Pratt's, you know, ain't no problem. I love Coach Pratt's. I love Coach. But when he didn't think I had it, Coach Nair knew I had it. You know what I mean? He 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 pushed me, man. He pushed us all. Don't get me wrong. He pushed us all. He pushed us to a level, man, that um, can't nobody hit you with a 
plastic baseball bat and you love him. He was all of our, our dads, man. All, all of us, man. Every last one of us. No one in that locker room can sit there and say the coach when they when the father figure their dad. You know, and, um, when he passed, it killed me. I couldn't even go to the funeral. It was that tough. He, he was a, to me, he's a monarch of, of, of Tiger basketball. He's the monarch of Tiger basketball. You talk about coaches and, and seeing high lower, Coach Nia is right there. No. I'm, I'm sure interviewing that team, they talk about the wiffle ball bat. Um, the wiffle ball bat, yeah, some of his tactics might not be acceptable in this day and age, but it sure was motivational. Um, and there's just to get you to hustle. You know, he had a, a lot of bark, so he didn't have to bite. A lot of times, you know, to go to practice, I would arrive with my uncle. And my uncle wasn't the most punctual person. So we would get there, and we'd get there right on time. And so I'm rushing to get dressed and get stretched out. You know, the first two or three drills, I don't really feel, because I'm not stretched out, you know. So then one particular day, we get there, and same type of deal, running late, you know, go get dressed, you know, go to practice, and, you know, go through practice, practice over. He's like, hey, Jerry. Yes, sir. He's like, you, you owe me some. I said, for what? He said, you were late. I said, I rode with you. <laughs> so he made me run seven double suicides after practice because I was late because I rode with him. So that, that uncle nephew thing was out there. I was just another I was just another player on the court. The 80s was a time where tough parenting meant love, you know, and his brand of coaching is you know, it, it prepares you for life because when I got into coaching, I started to realize like not every player responds the same way to a certain style of coaching. So there were times in my coaching years where I had to like literally find my inner coach Lanier because certain players responded better to that. So coach Lanier, a tough guy, but a guy that cared. And, and I think the impact that they had on their players years after they stopped playing for them showed that they had tremendous care for their players and the program.